In this video, I'll be demonstrating a combined footing in Risa Foundation. We'll be starting in a model here in Risa 3D that has loading in it already, so we can apply all these dead loads and live loads, wind loads from the different directions. And one of the things we make, need to make sure you do is use the categories here, so dead load, live load, wind load in the X direction, wind load in the Z direction. Uh, this category column is important as we take the model over to Risa Foundation. That's how Risa Foundation will interpret the loads for us. So I've got loading already in my model, and I'm going to run a load combinations here. I'm going to open that up and just run a batch solution with the envelope so it'll run through all of the diff all these different cases here and we'll see a, an envelope solution ready to go. So my joint reactions here in Risa 3D are going to be carried over into Risa Foundation. I'm going to use the director tool at the top right corner of my screen and we're going to choose Risa Foundation once a solution is present. We can take it over and we jump right into Risa Foundation automatically all of these loads are put in the model for me. Uh, if I see here the same loads we saw before, dead load, live load, let's take a look, live load, um, as I scroll down to wind loads, I'm going to choose also the wind load in the X direction, wind load in the Z direction, and I see that the loads are all applied to these nodes for me. If I open up the load category spreadsheet, I can see here there are point loads in the different directions, so again there's those categories we just saw over in Risa 3D. So in order to do a combined footing, we have single spread footings, but a combined footing, what we're going to do is use the slab here. So we draw or modify a slab. I'm going to click on that tool right there, and I can define a material set based on any of the materials we have in the material spreadsheet defaults. Uh, maybe I'll choose the 4,000 normal weight. If you need anything larger than that or different si sizing than that, what you can do is you can create your own materials here in the material spreadsheet. I'll go ahead back to my 4,000 normal weight, and let's call this an 18-inch slab thickness, and I can just start drawing. Now, to push apply, I can draw anywhere on the screen. Uh, what is helpful is to turn our drawing grid on. If I turn the drawing grid on, it has, gives me something to click to. So I'm just going to click an L-shape structure here. So I just kind of follow around and draw on that drawing grid to create a combined footing that's L-shaped. If we look at that, I actually drew that to the node, uh, which is a little bit short there. You would typically not want to have a column dying right at a corner. That would be uh, probably too close to the edge. So what I'm going to do is use my offset the slab here. So I click on modify the edge by offset distance, and I can tell the program to offset this by a certain size. So I'm going to say two feet is a good offset distance. Push apply and then click on the slab. And as I zoom out a little bit, I see that that slab now is a little bit larger. So let's see, let's get rid of our drawing grid so we can just see that a little bit. And we can see this rendered. If we look at an isometric view and then rendered here, we see the full thickness of that slab. And we can see that we have our point loads dropped right inside of that slab. So to go forward here, I'm going to go back to plan. I can drop in some pedestals, so that that will actually elevate that point load a little bit higher to represent how the column is going to land on our slab. Uh, so if I click on that pedestal, I say draw pedestals. I have the choice between a uh, concrete pedestal, round, or, or rectangular. I'll choose a rectangular one, and 12 by 12 sounds okay. That's about the right size for our columns coming down. Uh, this will be a 4,000 normal weight, and we'll say it's about 12 inches from the top of the slab. All I have to do is just click on the node and it drops it right in. And then we can also again look at this in isometric view. And we see that those loads are going to the top of that pedestal. I'm going to then go ahead and go into my load combinations. Let's go back to plan. And we'll go into our load combinations. Starting out in Risa Foundation, you have some two default load combinations, service and strength. What we can do is we can set up our own. Since these are just going to be basically just the dead load and the live load, we want to incorporate all of our different load combinations. So I'm going to delete these. Just mark those and right click. And they say delete mark lines. I'm going to use the load combination generator. If I click on the load combination generator, it allows me to do strength and um, ASD, allowable stress design. So we have a couple different options here for the years in the past. I'll pick the starting out with the IBC 2012 ASD. I'm going to choose reversible wind loads. And it is important to say the X and the Z since I use WLX and WLZ in my load categories over in Risa 3D. So I click on generate. I can go back in one more time and I'm going to do the strength there. 
So I'm going to say X and Z and reversible and say generate. So we see now if I look at this here, I have a variety of different combinations. Service is checked on for here all my ASD combinations and then strength is, is over here. Okay, so we see all that listed for us, automatically done. So I'm going to close that and then I can solve this model. I can click solve and it's going to run through and put point loads on all of those. Those were running through all the different combinations and it's going to design here the stresses in this lab. So we haven't addressed any of our design information just yet. All we've done is apply loads to the slab, and we're going to see how that slab behaves for all the load loading we've applied. Um, we can see the forces and all the moments, all, everything that's happening in that slab. So we've run through a long list of load combinations, so it's going through each single one and giving us some results here. So closing this out here, we can go, there's a lot of different information in the results. We can look at the point reactions of what's happening underneath the slab. Uh, we can look at point deflections if we're concerned with the deflection criteria. It's, we, it's important to note that the soil properties are being based off of the information on our global parameters. So if we go back to our global parameters, our solution tab, information on for the entire soil parameters here are our subgrade modulus here and our allowable bearing. So when we're looking at our point reactions and we're looking at the soil pressures, those are information that's coming right off of that global parameters. So we can see if the, the allowable bearing is listed here and this is the soil pressure that is going to be listed for our model so far. So everything's very, very um, under what we're allowed here for our allowable bearing, which looks all looks good. Um, we can also take a look at the slab itself for its forces. We have spreadsheets, plate forces, and plate corner forces, but sometimes it's difficult to interpret in a spreadsheet. It's a lot easier for us to see on the screen some of the contours. So you can use the tool up here to help us with these contours. This is a quick icon that will go through the shear, the moment in there. Um, also, we can look at the soil pressure on the screen, which is helpful, um, as well as that displacement right on the screen here graphically. So once we've gotten a handle on the slab behavior, it's what we want to do here is get design for this. So we're looking for the reinforcement design. So I can look at the design rules that we're going to be applying. If we go to the design rules spreadsheet, there is a mat slab tab there, and that gives us the top reinforcement and the bottom reinforcement. It also tells us the sizing that we're going to be going from. So it's going to be from minimum spacing for three inches up to eight inches, eight, excuse me, 18 inches, and then we see that same thing for the, for the bottom bars. Um, right now the program is going to optimize whether it needs top and bottom or just mid depth only. So we've got, we're going to say it's optimized. So the program we want, now we want to tell the program where to put that reinforcement. So the way we do that is with the design strip. On the left side of the screen there's a design strip button. You can click on that and we're now saying whether we want to have it horizontally run that rebar or vertical. So we'll go in both directions and we'll say plan horizontal. We'll start with that. And I'm going to click on the nodes there. So I can just click on nodes in order to create that horizontal. And I can just turn my drawing grid back on and that'll help me. And I can get here all of my reinforcement for this direction, horizontal. I can also go ahead and turn and do it in the vertical direction. So I'm going to go back in design strips and say plan vertical. And I can click on these nodes and then I can click on the midpoint here and I'll go down to, there we go. So I have now a horizontal and a vertical reinforcement design strip. Internally, the program is doing is it's cutting inside of this design strip and making cuts across that. So it's an internal force summation or what we call here is a design cut. And I can display these design cuts uh, right on by clicking on our our icon here. It says these are our auto cuts and we can say no labels. And we see that it's cutting across this design strip 50 times. That's a default. That design strip has 50 cuts, and that's listed here as our default number of cuts. Uh, you can increase that. If it's a really long design strip, I would recommend to increase that number. Sometimes it's really sh a short design strip. 50 might be too many, uh, but 50 is a good starting number. So internally, the program is cutting across this line and is getting a summation of forces across that line. If what we're seeing in that design cut is then we're going to see some of all the forces inside of that, but the design strip then takes a collection of what the worst case is of the cuts and it designs the, uh, all the reinforcement based on the worst cut. So I'm going to turn off the cuts for a second 
and let's take a look at our reinforcement. So when we look at the design strips here, cut results, we have them in spreadsheets. So we look at that strip reinforcement. We have design strip one, we have design strip two. Both of these are going to give us the reinforcement for each direction, and then it tells us the governing cut. Another way to look at this instead of a spreadsheet, it's a lot easier for us to see this in our detail report. So if we click on the detail report in the current view, I can see all of the forces along that entire design strip, shear and moment, and then as I scroll below that, I start to see the code check information, and then below that I get the bending steel. So this bending steel here tells us exactly what was put in provided bars, and it tells us for the top and the bottom provided bars, and the cut that governed there for us. So the design cut one, for design strip one, cut 29. If we see cut 29, I'm going to click on that, and I then see this is the information for that, what that governed for that cut. So we've got the top reinforcement listed with the governing MU here, the FMN top, and then it breaks it down into the top reinforcement as required versus what was provided. We can also go back to the strip here. We see that also for the bottom bars, if we scroll down, we see that the design strip cut uh, 7 was the one that was governing from the bottom. So it jumps to 29. We can toggle through to find the cut 7. So I'm going to jump back to 7. And this was controlling for our bottom. So this is a pretty low, least low stress. So probably what's happening is a lot of this is going to be based on the minimum requirements for steel. So we might want to say, hey, number 8 at 18 is probably too large of a bar. We could go ahead and change that. So if we went back to our footing, our, our design rules here, we see that we have our, our reinforcement dot number fives. Number eights are probably way too high, so let's jump that back down to number fives. And we'll change the top bars here to number fours. We can see if we can get a spacing that's a little bit tighter. So it's up to you and what you decide, what is important to you. Maybe a big bar is important because you don't, you don't have to place it that often. Maybe you want to size this down so less steel but more, uh, more often. It all sort of depends on what's important and uh, maybe the labor cost is important or versus the steel cost. Um, so those are toggles that you can change. This one you might even be able to tell the program here to maybe not to, to force mid-depth mid might have been more helpful for you. But all those things can be adjusted. Okay, so once we have all that, we can just see, let's take a look what our spacing is. So we did get a little tighter spacing. So we're looking at this now. If we look at the reinforcement, we're seeing that now we went to number four bars uh, at 14 and number five bars at 16. So it's changing the reinforcement spacing for us. And that is the conclusion of a combined footing in RISA foundation.